So I think it was the, yeah, the day before yesterday, I was mentioning about making an electrically powered hydrogen fueled blowtorch. And a lot of people were thinking that I was just meaning a torch in general, but I was meaning trying to fit everything into a handheld blowtorch where you fill water in, plug it in, it bubbles for a long time, it, it takes those bubbles and uses a little pump and compresses it down into a little thing of hydrogen. Well, that's a lot of stuff going on inside of a little handheld unit. I wonder if it's actually possible to make a heat gun where it's just electricity through a filament or spark gap where that heat gun can actually output more heat than hydrogen flame. I'm not sure actually. I guess the utmost you could probably do, or the, the maximum you could probably do is plasma. So you'd have a plasma torch, but then you have to deal with the plasma. I'm thinking if I could get a torch, I mean, okay, a thousand degrees output would be fine, but like 2000 degrees output, that would be amazing. Very interesting. I'm going to think of different ways to generate heat from electricity. Because I'm, I'm thinking with a filament, the highest I could possibly go is a few thousand degrees. Like for instance, nichrome wire goes to a few thousand degrees, of, or like maybe like 2,000 degrees or 1,800 degrees. And it'd be okay, but I think after a while, it would start to oxidize the filament. That's going to be the main issue. So for a heat gun, a high powered heat gun, I will need a filament to heat up and then a high powered fan to blow air through that. I wonder if it's possible to have more airflow or less faster airflow out the output than the input because the input will be cold air that is, that is small whenever it goes through, it will expand. So still the same mass going through, but it'll be a different velocity, as long as there's enough pressure on the input pump. I don't know, just a lot to think about. I kind of feel like watching a documentary about the Manhattan Project. I don't know, it's, that's totally random. But yeah, I feel kind, of, kind of feel like watching a documentary about the Manhattan Project. Although I don't know many documentaries that go in depth about all three nuclear programs that all that like the UK, Germany, and the US had because the UK had some project. I think it was like um, I can't remember the name of it. Like, I'll check. I don't need to remember. It's Google. Tube Alloys. That is a weird name for a project. Is Tube Alloys was the code name of the clandestine research and development program authorized by the government of the United Kingdom. Hmm. From forty two to fifty from forty two to fifty two. That is that's such a weird name for a project. I mean Manhattan Project is a weird name too, because it wasn't done in Manhattan. I could understand if the Manhattan Project was called the Chicago Project because Chicago was where nuclear reactions were first, like, the uh, first nuclear reactor was made. So I kind of understa understand that. But Manhattan is totally random also. But at least Manhattan Project, it sounds interesting. Tube Alloys, though, it just... It's a very good code name. Tube Alloys is a better code name. I would, I would, I would definitely say that. The American code name is too interesting. But if you, like for instance, if you're saying, oh, we're on the Manhattan Project, that's like, oh, what's that? Or, no, no, sorry, if you're working on the Manhattan Project, that's like, oh, what's that? If you're working on tube alloys, then it's like, oh, cool, you're into metallurgy. So I, I would have to say this, that is, that is a very ingenious name, if it's used in the same way that could be misleading to where if you knew what tube alloys was, then you know it's the project making a bomb. 
But if you don't know what two alloys is, you think it's, oh, you're working with two alloys or something like that. I guess. But you see, then we have the issue of two alloys just seems kind of meh of a code name after the fact. The Manhattan Project sounds pretty cool before. Wasn't there a German one? It's just called German, German Nuclear Weapon Pro Project. Translates to Uranium Society or Uranium Club. That's kind of... That's not much of a code name. That's just like saying, well, that basically that is Uranium Club. Yeah, well, that kind of sucked. Oh well. Speaking of the Manhattan Project, I think there was a movie in the 80s that was called The Manhattan Project and it really fucking sucked. My, my, uh, my aunt actually recorded it on VHS for me and gave it to me because she, she thought it was some documentary and I, oh, I know you're into that kind of stuff. So here you go, I recorded this for you and I was like, oh cool, I'll watch it. Manhattan Project. I can always watch stuff about the Manhattan Project. And it was that, it was, actually turned out to be that, that movie. And I really hated it because it was, I only saw it once, so I'm just going off memory, but it seemed like it was too preachy about radiation and experiments and stuff like that being automatically bad. I was like, well, it's, it's not automatically bad. Although I do remember one interesting thing about that film is that I think some at some moment in that film, the the main character has to make like a 3D model for the nuclear bomb he wants to build. That's the case. Somewhere in the film, there's a 3D model that is rendered on a little computer that displays the charges around and like an implosion style nuclear, a thermonuclear weapon, and. I remember that because at that time I'd only been able to work with three-sided polygons in computer graphics. I was like, let's see, 15, okay, yeah, so I was 15 when I saw that. And at that time I'd been using, I can't remember what, remember what program it was, it was a program made in the late 90s, very out of date, free on the internet. That was before I knew about Blender, but I got into Blender around like 2008, no, no, 2009, sorry. But up until that point, I would always wanted to make six-sided and five-sided polygons like in that movie, because in that movie, his computer was able to render five and six-sided polygons because it was like a soccer ball, basically. And that was just, it was it, like, I said, I spent a bunch of time like, figuring, out, figuring out how to do that. How do you render an N-GON? Ingon meaning anything other, bigger than three sides. Like, well, actually, three or four sides. I think a four-sided polygon is still an ingon. Not really sure. Well, then when I discovered Blender, Blender at the time, in like 2008, early 2009, was able to have three-sided polygons and four-sided polygons. So, it was like, oh wow, this is, these are ingons. At least only four-sided ones. Well then, like in, oh, I don't know, like 2011, 2012 or something like that? way uh, a good time after the redesign of Blender, they introduced more ingons. I think now it's just like as many polygon sizes as you want. Because like I, for instance, you can have, you now have the option to have, when you import a cylinder, because usually in Blender at least, whenever you want to make something, you start with, oh, I want a cylinder. Here's a cylinder. Oh, oh, I want a sphere or an ecosphere or I want a cube or a plane or something like that. You start with something and then you can modify that into whatever you want. Well, I think now with the option of ingons or tries, triangles, you can actually like click a box on there. And so if you hit triangles, it'll be, it'll make the in, ends of the, the polygon shaped like a pizza to where it has like triangles going in. But if you select ingons for that feature, it'll just make a single polygon with like 32 sides or however many columns are on the side of the uh, the polygon or the, the cylindrical polygon and or po cylinder well, it's not a cylindrical polygon that's 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 a stupid thing to say it's a cylinder made of polygons and however many sides you put on that it'll just have the same number of sides on the end like if it's 64 like polygons on the side of this 
cylinder, then it'll be 64 edges on the top, which is kind of interesting. Although, it it seems to just be like an interesting like overlay type thing because like for instance if you if you take that well let's imagine it's 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 a the end of a cylinder and has eight vertices it's like an eight-sided polygon well if you take one of these vertices and you raise it up the question is like if, if you raise it up like that Will it just be a disc? Like, will it draw this section in here? Or will it, like, fill this in to where it looks like a triangle from there? It looks like a saw that takes up the entire place. Because, of course, the end gun goes from here to here. Well, it seems like, at least in Blender, it just renders it as if there are a bunch of triangles there. It's just that it simplifies it by just throwing, kind of, kind of not showing that. So, if you make an ingon in that shape and you move it up, sometimes it'll be like, it'll just be like, it'll follow that way and it'll follow that way. But then other times when you fold it up, it'll be like, it, it falls that way and falls that way. And it's kind of weird. It's, it's, it's like, it's like, a, you know, it's so weird. So, it, it kind of begs the question of why not just use triangles anyway? Kind of makes you think like, do, are ingons an actual thing or is it just that the computer just turns it back into triangles anyway? Well, that's pretty much it. I think I'm going to go to bed. Hope you guys enjoyed this video, and thanks for watching. See ya!